How's it? Welcome back. Ready for chapter 15. Halfway through the book. It's about to pull my tea. Yeah. <laughs> All in a day's work. I'd spent the night at the ranch of my friend, Buck de Fries. He is unique in that he probably has shot more lions in his lifetime than anyone else in the world. It's hard to be a cattle rancher on the edge of a national park that is overpopulated with lions. And anyone who has shot one lion has a story to tell. Mine are rather boring compared to Buck's, but nonetheless, they are stories that I like to tell myself once in a while. I embellish them, tell myself that a true story is one that could have happened, and every year that passes, I remember a detail that I hadn't noticed at the time. But Buck is a storyteller, making you feel like you were right there, watching the white cloud of steam form over the carcass of a freshly strangled cow, knowing that there are lions all around but you can't see them, and the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end as the story unravels, sometimes even making your armpits sweat. Just at the right time, he stops talking, takes his pipe out of his mouth, and knocks the ash out on the heel of his felskun, nodding his head wisely, and then carries on with the story. And because the stories are so alive and exciting, Many people have wanted to go on a lion hunt with them. This too has created situations, dramas that have been embarrassing to the people and entertaining to the listeners. We had heard the cattle running and knew that the lions were there. We took the spotlight and it wasn't long before we had shot two lions, loaded them onto the, loaded them onto the crew land cruiser and had taken them back to the house to be skinned. While the skinners are doing this, Buck and I traded stories over a large pot of rooibos tea. There's a bullet hole in the window pane next to where Buck usually sits, and as he talks, he slowly rolls the end of his cigarette on the edge of the hole, making a small pile of ash on the ledge outside. Before we knew it, we had talked most of the night away, and I had to be work at I had I had to be at work by eight o'clock in the morning. I fairly flew the 240 kilometers home to Bulawayo and arrived just as the dawn was breaking. I quietly let myself into the house and kissed my wife on the neck, giving her a start. I showered and then woke up my two little boys, telling them all about the lions and the different animals I had seen on the way to home. A clean, long-sleeved shirt, long pants to cover the fact that I didn't wear socks, leather shoes, my gold rimmed glasses, and the professional was ready to go to work. Right, let me get my tea. Oops, spilled my milk. No need to cry though. Cheers. Mm. Mm. Love a good cup of hot tea. Eh? <clears throat> Phyllis is my lion-faced, no-nonsense receptionist. She had been the wife of a miner who had died, leaving her with four children to raise. Her children were all grown up now, and she was the ideal person for me to have up front. She had a look that would peel paint off a wall, so I never had trouble with payments. At the, sim at the same time, she was a pillar. Great protection and a good source of meals when I was in the dog box. As I walk in, she looks she looks me up and down and snaps, You're too old to be staying up all night. What have you been doing? 
Without waiting for an answer, she carries on. You have two days' work packed in here. Show me what you want it cancelled. I go down the list, and we talk about each patient, and she tells me what she was told over the phone. The out-of-town patients get priority and get extra time so that I can do all that needs to be done. Ah, this Ramsey chappy says he has a Christmas beetle in his ear. Hmm, sounds like a wisdom tooth problem, I comment. Give me 45 minutes on that one. How many cases at the theater today? I take all my cowards and do all the dental work under general anesthetic at the surgical theater next door. As there are no oral surgeons in Bulawayo, and the Mosquito Ingo Indians in Nicaragua had told me, had taught me so well, I am saddled with all the difficult extractions in town. However, it's the one thing in dentistry I actually love to do. The cutting, the removal of bone, figuring out how the roots lie in relationship to the nerves, sewing it up all neatly at the end. It all makes for a very satisfying mission accomplished. <coughs> While Phyllis and I go through the list, Bones brings me my first cup of tea. My, bo my boys named him Bones. His name was actually Mabundu, which gradually became Bones. He is a part of me. Wherever I go, he is with me. Whether it is hunting, or riding the white waters of the Zambezi River, or flying a plane, Bones is usually there one step away. When I'm in the dental office, he is my tea maker. He runs all the errands, develops x-rays, and pays my bills. Judy, the cute black-haired assistant, comes in like a whirlwind just ahead of the first patient. Judy knows me better than I actually know myself. When we work together, she knows exactly what to hand me, without, say, without me saying a word. She oozes warmth and radiates joy. Her husband, Paul, is a lucky man. I'm a lucky too, because Paul shares... Paul often shares some of Judy's baking with me. All the patients love Judy, and I'm sure a lot of them come in just to feel her hand on, the, on their shoulder. She is one of those user-friendly, touch-me-feel-me types. I can give her a hug, or she can pinch my bottom, and it's all right. She has worked for me for four years now, from the very beginning. My worst nightmare would be to lose her for one reason or another. I can see Judy talking to a young lady in tight jeans. They are chatting, and from the young lady's voice, I can tell she's very nervous. When I go into the surgery, I'm greeted with, No offense, but I really hate dentists. Bad experiences, I counter. Very bad, she almost whispers. Pain, lots. Now we're getting somewhere. She's starting to look at me when she talks. <clears throat> I carry on. Haven't been to a dentist in quite some time, have you? How can you tell? She cocks her head to one side to see me better. Well, I can see a filling that needs to be done in one of your front teeth. And if there's one in front, then there are definitely more in the back. And if you hate me already, then I would say you hated others before me. Oh, I didn't mean you. I just meant general dentists in general. Now she's turning red. I look at her chart and see she is 22, single, and her name. Right, Miss Fenta. Let's take a couple of x-rays. This is not at all painful. I put the x-rays in her mouth and take a shot from both sides. I give them to Judy who bustles down the hall, and in two minutes she has them back to me. All the time I'm chatting with Miss Fenter, finding out what she does for work, where she went to school, and telling her a bit about myself. When the x-rays come back, I take a look and tell her the news she's been dreading. You only have 12 fillings, and if, I, and if you were my daughter, I would make you have those wisdom teeth out before they give you problems. Your mouth is too small for them, and the, lower two, and the two lower ones are laying on their side. I show her the x-rays and how the wisdom teeth are laying horizontally. Oh, <clears throat> what shall I do? She squeaks, wringing her hands. If you want, we can put you to sleep, and when you wake up, you'll be sore from having the wisdom teeth out but it all will be done. Would you like that? Her face, her face brightens when she realizes she can skip this whole dental scene. You bet. When can you do it? Go talk to Phyllis and tell her to book you two hours at the theater. She'll give you the complete lecture on what you can and can't do. 
and you'd better do it or she'll eat you like a green mealy. Miss Fenter leaves all smiles. Fifteen minutes of the day gone, and I look out the window to the north. <coughs> My dreams carry me running through the tall cathedral mapani trees. Impalas are scattering to the sides, running, patting, panting, the sweat soaking my shirt. Judy is holding my arm. Bill, stop dreaming and sort out your next patient. Filling fallen out on number three for Mr. Jackson. I greet Mr. Jackson and place the topical anesthetic on the gum, next to the tooth that needs the, fi the filling. When 15 seconds has passed, I know that the gum is numb, and slip the end of a 30-gauge needle just under the gum. He hasn't felt a thing. I ease in a drop of juice slowly so as to not expand the tissue too fast. This allows the gun to get numb before the needle is put in any further. It's always a game to see whether I can give an injection without the patient feeling anything. If they do feel anything, it's usually just a swelling of the tissues. When you give a painless injection, you could transplant the patient's ear onto his forehead and they would think it was great. <laughs> I go into my office and write up Miss Fenter's notes while the injection is taking effect. I can hear Judy talking to Mr. Jackson, and when the five minutes is up, I go back to the surgery and know that in seven minutes, the filling will be done. Just like my dad said about operating, it's, it's all nuts and bolts. It's all nuts and bolts after a while. You know to the minute how long it will take you to do each job. As I check for decay in the tooth, I chat with Judy. Patients always complain about dentists talking to them when they have their mouth open, so I've made it a point never to do that. Judy asks me all about my night in the bush, and I play it down so as to not seem as though I'd had a good time. Too good, too good of a time. Mr. Jackson's hand goes up and I stop drilling. Yes, Mr. Jackson. I want to talk too, you know. No, Mr. Jackson, Judy says, putting her hand on his shoulder and smiling, her eyes fairly sparkling with mischief. You are not allowed to talk, otherwise you might get the filling in the wrong spot, or maybe something worse. She giggles, and we carry on with our conversation. In seven minutes we are done, and I set the chair up into the sitting position. Mr. Jackson stands and thanks me, shaking my hand. And you, he says, shaking his finger at Judy, you are something else. I don't know how you two get anything done with all that chatting going on. He smiles at Judy and thanks her, and heads for the reception area. <clears throat> a whole family of five is in for a checkup. While we're doing the checks, Judy points to the shoes of the kids. There are holes in the soles of their shoes. Judy runs her fingers along the frayed collar of the little boy, as though she is straightening it, and I know exactly what's going on through her head. The whole family is standing in the little surgery because they like to ask questions while I'm checking, and I get a chance to explain a few things. Please tell Ryan to brush his teeth, Dr. Taylor. All right, Ryan, you've got to brush your teeth once a month, whether you like it or not. Got that? Ryan nods his head fervently, and his mother <laughs> rolls her eyes in despair. <clears throat> when the family have had all their checkups, I write down that the bill is only for one checkup and send them down to Phyllis. Your Christmas beetle patient is here now, Bill, Judy says. The Christmas beetle is a cicada, <clears throat> and the Christmas period is their mating season. During this time, they make an absolute deafening racket to attract a mate. I'm most curious about having one in the ear. <clears throat> Mr. Ramsey, they tell me you have a ringing in your ear. Judy is seating Mr. Ramsey, and his face is contorted with pain. Guy, this thing started up a couple of days ago, and I haven't slept since then. I slip in an x-ray and hold his face as I shoot. I never thought it could be a tooth, but that's what the quack says. That's why I called you up. Thanks for taking me so quickly. Let me just put some topical anesthetic at the back of your mouth, and while it's taking effect, I'll explain to you how this buzzing occurs. I put in some topical anesthetic where I'm going to inject, and tell him how the trigeminal ganglion is the nerve center for the eye, ear, temple, and lower jaw. 
Pressure on any of these nerves can cause referred pain, and so pressure on the inferior alveolar nerve, the nerve that supplies the teeth of the lower jaw. No, and so pressure on the alveolar nerve, the nerve that supplies the teeth of the lower jaw, can cause a ringing or buzzing in the ear, or even pain in the eye or temple. While I'm talking, I inject a bit of Novocaine into the inferior alveolar nerve and let it take effect. Judy brings back the x-ray, and I show Mr. Ramsey how the roots to the wisdom tooth have grown down and actually caused a bend in the nerve canal. I give an extra injection to make sure everything is well and properly numb, and then go and do another checkup in the surgery next door. By the time I come back, Mr. Ramsey is playing with his numb lip. Would you mind uh, giving me a, a running commentary while you work? I'm quite curious as to how you're going to get that tooth out. I can't even see it when I look in the mirror. Not a problem. Obviously knives and needles don't bother you. Nah, not a bit, eh? I do all my cattle problems and have to do a lot of cutting myself. actually quite enjoy it. Yeah, touche. I enjoy cutting as well. Right. I'm going to stick this rubber gobstopper on the other side so you can relax your jaw. I give him the rundown as I make the incision, telling the position of the cut and where so as to avoid cutting nerves. <coughs> I peel back the gum and then with a high speed drill take off the bone covering the tooth. The crown of the tooth is rounded so when I get an so when I get an elevator between the wisdom tooth and the tooth next to it, it's easy to elevate the tooth. I raise it up about two millimeters and then look at Judy. Mr. Ramsey is trying to is only trying to talk with the rubber stopper in his mouth. He's waving and pointing at his ear. Judy takes out the rubber stopper and immediately he blurts, a, blurts out, "Hey, the buzzing has stopped. I've got no more buzzing in my ear." He's all excited and then Judy tells him to open up and puts the stopper back in place. My evil sense of humor makes me push the tooth back into position. And right away you can see the buzzing has started again. A mischievous guy. Huh? Then I pop the tooth out, put in a suture, and leave the rest to Judy for instructions on how to care for the wound. I go have a cup of tea and feel the satisfaction of helping someone. My next patient proudly tells me that he forgot to brush his teeth, but knew I wouldn't mind. I proudly tell him, as I start to examine his teeth, that I've just been to the toilet and forgot to wash my hands. <laughs> I know that always puts across the message. He told his wife what I had said, and when she came the following week, she told me an interesting story. She had told me that she remembered at the last moment that she had a gynae appointment. So I quickly went to the bathroom and had a quick wash wipe with the face cloth. During her examination, her gynae <laughs> told her that she needn't have gone to all the trouble. She was not too sure what he was talking about until she got home and noticed that the face cloth, the face cloth she had used, <laughs> the, the face cloth she had used had been used previously to take all the glitter off the face of one of her kids. We had a good laugh on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is that's brilliant, man. <clears throat> My all-night experience in the bush is starting to tell, and I long to lay down and have a sleep, but I have one more treat in store before the day is done. I take two x-rays and do an exam on lovely Michelle. I hand her a mirror and tell her to have a look at one of her teeth. She then informs me that she is totally blind. But you walked in here and sat down perfectly. I oh, know. She smiles and looks straight into my eyes. I went to a special school that teaches you how to walk and follow people's voices. I look straight into your eyes because I can hear exactly where your mouth is. I can fool most people. Wow, that's amazing. And do you cook and pour tea? I ask. Oh yes. I can hear when a teacup is almost full. And my kitchen is fitted out so I know where everything is. I only have one eye. I was born like that, and I've never considered it a handicap. I wait to see if Michelle will pick up the cue. 
Oh, I've never considered blindness a handicap. I just miss out on a few things, but I figure everyone does in one way or another. <laughs> she smiled at me, and I learned a priceless lesson in like just a couple of minutes. I also kicked off my shoes, as I knew she couldn't see, and then forgot to put them on again before the next patient. I was standing looking out the window when Judy came in with the next patient. Are you going to put on your shoes, Bill? No, I figure Mr. De, <laughs> Mr. De Villiers has seen me barefoot now. I won't try and impress him with shoes. So I finished off the day with a couple of fillings and then rode my bicycle home. <clears throat> the church pastor was there, waiting to visit with my wife and me. I excused myself, telling him I had had a rough day and was willing to talk if I could stretch out on the sofa, which I did. His chatter sounded too much like his sermons, and in two minutes I was fast asleep. When I awoke, I had missed dinner, story time with Matt and Moz, the pastor's leaving, and my wife had turned out all the lights. Right, it's <coughs> the end of chapter 15. A bit shorter than yesterday's chapter, eh? Well, good night, sleep well. Check you tomorrow, eh? Cheers.